Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Despite my original intention being to limit my response to logic to giving him the help he requested in understanding spoken English, I am moved by pity for some atheists in my comments section who seem to think that logic made some sort of cogent critique of something I said. So I'm going to go through the rest of logic's video. In the interest of this video not being absurdly long, the explanations will not be nearly as thorough as in my first video. For the same reason, I will sometimes summarize logic's statements instead of quoting them in full. If you can't remember his video well enough to check my summaries against your memory, please watch his video in a second tab alongside with mine. And my apologies to those who would rather see me talk about positive subjects. I'm not going to make a habit of these response videos. As you may recall, Logic's video began with an epic misunderstanding of Rob's fairly straightforward statement. I'm not going to recap it here. I will say, though, that if Logic ever talks about the Bible, it's worth remembering that he couldn't understand even a contemporary Christian talking. I can't even imagine how badly he would misunderstand the words of Jews and pagans from 2000 plus years ago. So, after the part I addressed in my previous video, Logic goes on to complain that I blocked him on Twitter. He had no way of knowing this, but I was just following my policy of blocking obnoxious atheists with more than a thousand followers. I do this so that my mentions, and therefore notifications, aren't filled with idiots trying to get their senpai to notice them by attacking his enemies. I don't believe that Logic is actually interested in honest conversation, but if he is, he's perfectly capable of creating a second account with no followers to conduct it from. Not that it matters, but I actually had no idea who Logic was when I blocked him. I just saw a stupid tweet from an atheist, saw the semi-professional avatar, checked his follower account, and blocked him because he met the criteria I used to keep Twitter useful. I know that it's popular among atheists on Twitter to hold that people block them out of sheer terror at their awesomeness, but I can't help but ask if these people realize how clueless this makes them look. Do they really believe that no one could possibly think that they're just a waste of time? That's my default assumption when people block me on Twitter. It doesn't mean I think they're right, it's just basic realism about how human beings work. Next, Logic took issue with my characterization of Max Colby of the Escaping Atheism Project as a conversational street brawler because he too blocked Logic on Twitter. Now, one interpretation of blocking Logic is that Max is deeply scared of Logic. And in fairness, some people do find clowns scary. But I asked him, and Max isn't one of those people. Another interpretation is that Max looked at what Logic said and came to the conclusion that Logic was a disingenuous joke whose only real goal is to entertain his followers in the manner of a high school class clown. I can't speak for Max, but if your interpretation is that Max was terrified of the intellectual powerhouse that is Logic, and that far from talking to Logic being a poor use of time, he thought it would be so productive a use of time that his worldview would be shattered and he'd be reduced to gibbering about how he lacks a belief in God. If you really think that, then please leave a comment with your full name, street address, bank account numbers, social security number, date of birth, and mother's maiden name. I've got a bunch of gold a Nigerian oil prince transferred to me, and I need to transfer it to someone else for a few months for... safekeeping. First, I'll need to transfer all of your money to me, uh, so we can keep track of the interest accrued on the Nigerian oil money. I look forward to doing business with you. And since I recently watched Logic's video, let me add, I'm just kidding. I do not really have Nigerian oil money. Do not leave a comment which would allow someone to perpetrate identity fraud upon you. I do not look forward to doing business with you. There is also a section where Logic explains that he doesn't understand the concept of rhetoric. That wasn't his phrasing, but he predicates his actual commentary on the idea that what one person says to another in the middle of an argument is always their considered policy, and never meant, for example, to stimulate the person they're talking to into looking at things from a perspective they hadn't previously considered. His commentary also suggests that he's unfamiliar with Locke's argument in A Letter Concerning Toleration that atheists were in a special position because they lack a religion and, as such, alone among men, should not be tolerated. That's John Locke, the father of classical liberalism. I'm not endorsing this argument, mind you, only pointing out yet another thing that Logic doesn't know, which results in him not understanding what other people say. 
The fact that atheism is not a religion means that, while it doesn't have to be treated differently than religions, atheism can rationally be treated differently than religions. To put this in a way that will be more familiar to internet atheists, if atheism is not a belief, only the lack of a belief, it does not need to be treated equally to a belief. Just something to keep in mind. Moving on, Logic talks about the importance of talking with him again. It's getting really obvious that Logic premises a lot of what he says on his personal importance. Now, it is possible to take this as not being genuinely self-important, because Logic is an entertainer. People can identify with those they are fans of. As such, his placing enormous importance on himself personally can be taken as vicariously placing importance on his fans. It's kind of an inversion of vicarious atonement. You can see something analogous in the royal we. The king represents all his people, and as such, insults to him are insults to his people, and so forth. Similarly, a public entertainer can be a sort of plural person when he is acting in his capacity as a public entertainer. It is possible, then, to take Logic's self-importance as meant to represent the importance of his viewers. It's still really weird to watch, though, since the conversation he's commenting on had nothing to do with him, or except accidentally, his viewers. Also, he makes the fundamental mistake a lot of internet atheists seem to make about what a Christian's duty is. It's our job to give the good news to all people, not to make them believe it. Those who hear the gospel are still free to go to hell, both literally and metaphorically. Obviously, we Christians would prefer if they didn't, for their sake, but free will means that people can reject the truth if they're so inclined. And before anyone goes blathering to me about how he hasn't seen enough evidence, it doesn't matter what I think. I don't matter. No one appointed me your judge. Save your excuses for someone who can excuse you. Next, he comes up to the clip where I talk about inviting people to present evidence that they're honest. If you really want to piss them off, by the way, just invite them to give you evidence that they're honest. Uh, They want you to take it on faith? Then he doesn't address it, but instead brings up the subject of who we were talking about. Now, bear in mind the original live chat is basically a few friends reminiscing about similar experiences, and sharing that with an audience, much of whom has also had similar experiences. There's not really much to say about that, though, so Logic decides to do the honest thing and skip ahead to a section of the conversation where there is something to talk about. Just kidding. He decides to reinterpret it so that he can criticize it as stupid. Anyway, since these things aren't addressed to any particular atheist, I'll answer them as though they're addressed to me, for the sake of discussion. It's really the only way this is going to work. I would like to think that I don't need to point out how utterly stupid this is, if he's serious, since changing part of the meaning of a sentence without adapting the rest says nothing about the original. Here, I'll demonstrate. I'm going to assume that Logic's video is addressed to a houseplant. It's really the only way that this next bit is going to work. I'd encourage you to watch the whole thing Dude, you're talking to a houseplant. Maybe they didn't teach you this in atheist school, but houseplants don't have eyes. They can't watch anything. If you get a kick out of cringe. It's a houseplant. The only things it gets a kick out of are water and sunlight. And maybe fertilizer. It's like a couple hours long and there's a lot in there. Basic biology. Houseplants don't know how long a human hour is. For that matter, houseplants don't have ears. It can't hear you. Why are you talking to a houseplant? Okay, hopefully that makes the point. When listening to someone talk, you're supposed to try to figure out what they mean by their words. Creatively redefining their words is not a legitimate form of criticism. So, basically everything from this point on is tainted, but what the heck. I can pretend that he's not about to dishonestly lecture me about intellectual integrity. I, I point this out to a bunch of people, like, like, okay, you know, I invite you to give me evidence that you're honest, you know, that you're asking this question honestly, or, you know, that you actually accept evidence. I mean, do you want me to take it on faith that you accept evidence? I'm going to excise a bit where he goes on and on about how hurt he is that I blocked him on Twitter. This guy is married and has over 99,000 subscribers on YouTube and 15,000 followers on Twitter. Why is he so sensitive to rejection by someone he doesn't even respect? Someone, please tell his wife that he really needs a hug. I expect you to take it on faith that I'm honest? Well, no. Obviously not. 
What I would expect is that if you were a person with an average or even slightly sub-average level of intellectual honesty, you would find it best to begin with no assumptions about my honesty and then approach me as someone who you haven't yet identified as either typically honest or typically dishonest. He keeps going for a while, but this is the meat of it. Now, I'd like to reiterate that I know that in reality he's probably intentionally misunderstanding this in order to earn money as an entertainer, but leaving that aside and pretending this is serious, what he entirely misses out on is the concept of opportunity costs. The time I spend talking with him is time I am not spending doing any number of other things, including talking to others. Coming up to me and talking to me is, within the context of ordinary human politeness, implicitly making the claim that he is not wasting my time by doing so. It is also ordinary politeness to take this implicit claim on faith until one has evidence to the contrary. But the sort of atheists I was actually talking to say that you shouldn't believe claims until someone provides you evidence that they're true. What I'm doing here is demonstrating how selectively the people who espouse this principle apply it. Now, just to be clear, since Logic seems to have a big hang-up on the fact that I blocked him on Twitter, his one tweet at me was some stupid blather about genocide. I took it as conclusive evidence about how good a use of time talking to him would be, which it in fact was, and acted accordingly. Since I had never so much as heard of Logic back when I was making my comments in the live stream, I should point out that I was actually talking about people who were not manifest idiots, and so there was some doubt that I could give them the benefit of, in clear violation of their stated principles. Now, I know that most atheists think don't assume people are a waste of time is a moral rule, rather than a matter of epistemology, but if you ask why, there is no answer, morally speaking, because we don't owe it to random strangers to let them waste our time. That talking with someone will be a good use of time is a positive proposition. If you're an atheist, you're probably more used to calling that a positive claim, which you can either assume or have evidence for. Even to talk to them, just to find out if talking with them is a good use of time, is to assume that trying to find out if they're worth talking to is itself a good use of time. And it would only be a good use of time if it seemed likely that talking to them is a good use of time. In short, you do not know ahead of time that talking to someone will be a good use of time, and presently we default to the charitable assumption that it is a good use of time. That is not the norm in all cultures and all times. There are plenty of places and times where people would not talk to strangers and required an already trusted party to vouch for the stranger before being willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. Hence the practice of introductions, letters of introduction, and so on. When it comes to strangers, traditional cultures have traditionally been far more skeptical than modern, especially American, culture. And that's probably because American culture is so commercial all a merchant really cares about is the color of your money. A final note on this. It's always amusing when someone accuses me of intellectual dishonesty for acting according to his principles when dealing with him. And in fact, in my experience, the most reliable way to make an atheist mad at me is to take what he says he believes seriously. Determinists, for example, really hate being reminded that they don't believe in free will. There might be a lesson in that. Moving on. I'm going to address the next bit out of order because he spends a really long time on a tangent, so as not to break up the flow, I'll address the tangent first. This, by the way, is probably the closest in the entire video that Logic came to saying something worth listening to. To say that God is possible requires more knowledge than I think these people realize. You have to have somehow discovered that the ultimate nature of reality, be it physical or otherwise, is capable of supporting such a non-physical thinking being. This is rather backwards. Christians hold that God is the ultimate reality which is capable of supporting us, not the other way around. Also, as a side note, we hold that God is necessary, not that God is possible. A merely possible God could not be the ultimate ground of all that is. That it's possible for something, anything, to exist before and outside the universe, for lack of better terminology. Since this universe obviously didn't make itself, things can't make themselves since they don't exist yet to do it, it's pretty obvious that something must exist before and outside the physical universe. Even if it's just some other universe with a black hole, or a quantum fluctuation in... well, I've never heard it specified in what. Or whatever framework that the believers in the infinite multiverse believe makes every possibility happen. Also if, as the argument for motion or the argument from contingency and necessity show, something must exist outside of time and space, 
It is, therefore, possible that something exists outside of time and space. And if anyone tells you that these arguments have been debunked, they're lying. That an entity can exist that can conjure something, in this case an entire universe, from nothing, with, in the case of Christianity, words. This statement about Christianity is ambiguous. It's unclear whether he means that the physical universe was conjured from words, or that words were conjured from nothing. If the former, a small philosophy lesson is in order. Language is inherently rational. That is why the Greek word logos meant word, thought, rationality, argument, and related concepts. Without going into a full-blown lesson in semiotics, language is composed of words in a grammar, that is, symbols which point to reference, arranged in ways such that the relationships between the reference is reflected in the arrangement of the symbols. To say that God spoke the world into existence is to say that he created it according to his rational idea. It does not mean that there were vibrations in the air, which didn't exist yet. If he means the latter, this is relevant too, actually, and in both cases, God is held by Christians to create out of himself, not out of something else in the manner of a sorcerer casting a spell which rearranges things with an independent existence. An analogy which might be helpful is that God is imagining us, like an author imagines a story. That it's possible for a being to perceive every particle without affecting them in any way. The analogy of a reader reading a book might be useful here. The reader of a book reads all the words of a book without disturbing any of them, precisely because he is outside the book. To physically move each and every particle with no physical mechanism. Here the analogy of an author may be helpful once again. The author of a novel moves the words around without needing to use other words to do it. In a similar way, God is the ground of our being. It is his power which sustains our existence in every moment. Of course he can move things without a physical mechanism, their very existence and nature come from him in all moments of their existence. Okay, so now on to the original point I made, which triggered this tangent. Actually, wait, I forgot. There's this part. And a similar problem could be seen to exist from the opposite side, that to have a compelling reason to believe that the universe is possible without God, you have to know more than we know now about what is and is not possible. And by the way, Chris, there's a marginally compelling argument in there somewhere against the God doesn't exist type atheist if you're clever enough to assemble it. You can have that one for free. Next time you're going to have to pay me. I'm not here to beef up your apologetics for you. I'd like a refund. First, because I respect the God doesn't exist atheists more, since they're at least willing to own up to what their position actually is. Yes, they can't prove it, but at least they're not lying about their convictions. To help someone out of his error, you need to address his convictions not get him to lie about not being convinced. Second, this is utterly irrelevant even to apologetics. Apologetics is all about getting people to reason about the world, in many cases to start reasoning about the world. It is not about getting them to stop reasoning about the world, which is what this argument would do. And third, I don't do apologetics. I used to when I was younger, and I may again someday, but at present, my position is that I will give the good news to anyone who has not heard it, and I will answer questions asked in good faith, but I'm not presently trying to convince atheists of anything religious. The arguments I have with atheists, lately, are all on secular subjects, mostly one aspect of epistemology or another. The same, I pointed out to one guy that, um, well, you're at least making the implicit claim that it is possible the world could exist without God. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, I'm not. Okay, so, so you don't believe in God, but you don't even think it's possible that the world could exist without God. Now, skipping about two and a half minutes ahead, we get his actual answer. But remember, you're not talking to a God-does-not-exist type atheist in your scenario. You're complaining about atheists who say that they just don't believe that God exists. So this guy doesn't even necessarily believe that the universe originated without a God at all. He's just not convinced that it did. So, if he's not going around claiming the universe is possible without God, that's perfectly consistent with his stated position on the God question. Just as he doesn't have to commit to a yes or no answer about whether God exists, he also doesn't have to commit to a yes or no answer about whether the universe is possible without a God. When you don't actually know something, I don't know is a perfectly valid position. If he just feels like he doesn't have enough information and so he just avoids making ignorant claims based on information he thinks he doesn't have, that's respectable. That's what he should be doing. You should respect that if you have the slightest respect for intellectual honesty and truth itself. Perhaps this wasn't obvious, but the reason I was talking with this guy was not that I sought him out. 
He was lecturing people on Twitter about atheism and also about how theism is irrational. That is not an act of intellectual humility. Now, I stand by everything I said in my video, Dear Lack of Belief Atheists, I'm Not Your Father, but I'm going to give a bit of fatherly advice anyway, since so many atheists' fathers seem to have failed them so badly. If you don't know anything on a subject, keep your mouth shut about it. Do not go seeking people out and lecturing them on the subject about which you hold that you know nothing. In short, if you believe that you have nothing to say, don't say it. If you do anyway, you have no business lecturing anyone on any kind of honesty, intellectual or otherwise. He rants for a while after this, but much of what he says seems to be predicated on the idea that he doesn't understand that actions are consistent with some beliefs and inconsistent with others. If, for example, a man chooses to have sex with a woman to whom he is not married, this is consistent with moralities in which that is moral and inconsistent with moralities in which that is immoral. Now, if a man goes and does this and thinks that he has done well by doing it, he is clearly affirming a position which is contrary to religious moral claims such as those of Christianity, and Judaism, and Islam, and some forms of Hinduism, and so forth. As long as one affirms logic to be valid, it is irrelevant whether a man says that Christianity is false or that something which contradicts Christianity is true. In neither case is he taking a position of ignorance about Christianity. A man who is in a genuine position of ignorance would try to hedge his bets as much as possible and live by the intersection of moral systems he thought might apply to him. The fact that lack of belief atheists do not do this, and in fact live as if none of the religious moral systems apply to them, gives the lie to the intellectual humility being claimed. Further, a sane man does not publicly mock things he holds may in fact be deep truths which he just doesn't yet understand. If you see a man publicly mock Christianity, you know that he believes it to be false. Consider this analogy. I have called logic dishonest several times in this video and will probably do it several times more. If, when challenged on this, I said, I merely lack a belief that logic is honest because I haven't seen convincing evidence that he's honest, you would think that I was being a dishonest weasel. And rightly so. That's why I've backed it up every time with showing reasons I have for believing that logic was being dishonest. My actions are consistent only with that position. Next, there is a clip in which I said that I respect atheists who take a noetic position. I actually have a fair amount of respect for atheists who will say, you know, who will take the noetic approach and say that I look at the world and this is clearly a world that does not have a god, you know, that, that does not have a god. Anyone who will actually do that, if, if they simply say, like, I don't have an argument for it, I simply look out on the world and this is what I see and I know this to be the case, I respect that. In the, now, I also respect somebody who looks out in the world and says, like, well, obviously there's a god in charge of this. Neither one of those is an argument in favor of it, but I respect both of those as people willing to have a position. And, you know, just because you can't articulate an argument for your position doesn't make the position illegitimate. He doesn't include the bit significantly earlier in the conversation in which I defined noesis, from which comes the word noetic, since it's not an English word. Now, if you actually think that there might possibly be something worthwhile in this video, ask yourself why he didn't include the part where I defined a key term, or at least look it up himself and tell you its definition. Anyway, what he does do is rant for a while. I'm starting to feel really bad that the people who collectively paid him $2,200 for this got this garbage in exchange for their money, but I'll simply explain the point in more detail since nothing he said was relevant to what I said. Go look at another person. What logical argument can you put forward that they are in fact a human being? If you were to write it down right now, with the premises and the steps in the argument all numbered, the odds are extremely good that it would be a bad argument. Remember that the premises must be things which you know at the time you wrote the argument. Suppose it's a friend. Have you ever performed a DNA test on them to see if they've got human DNA? If not, you can't put that down as a premise because you don't know it. And you'll run really fast into questions of robots with human skin covering them, Terminator style. If you actually take this exercise seriously and try, you will discover that you almost certainly could not articulate a conclusive argument based on premises you know to be true, which would stand up to the scrutiny of a dedicated skeptic with years of training and argumentation. Does that mean that you are not justified in holding that the person you looked at was in fact a human being? Obviously, it 
doesn't mean that. You have good reasons for believing them to be a human being, but it takes rather large amounts of training to be good at setting out arguments rigorously, and when faced with a dedicated skeptic there will be a very large number of objections your argument will need to anticipate. Most people can't do that. This doesn't mean that most people believe what they believe for no reason. And that's what I was talking about. Just because a man can't articulate an argument for his position doesn't mean that he has no good reasons for his position. And a man willing to admit that he knows something, but can't explain why he knows it, is vastly more admirable than a man who pretends that he doesn't believe anything because he only believes what he can rigorously defend. Next, Logic quotes me describing this meme. Two things atheists lack a belief in, the goddess Gaia, the god Helios. You probably should have thought that through before making slogans. He then commented, Chris, Helios and Gaia were more than just the sun and the earth. They had minds and personalities, that's what made them gods. If we're to say there's actual evidence for the existence of the gods, Gaia and Helios, that is what we need evidence for. Now, in case you still somehow think that Logic is an honest man, I'm going to play the part in the Hangout which happened immediately after I described this meme. And which gets to the point again of hacking this, that they will then start to say like, well, no, not, you know, obviously I believe in the sun and the earth, just not that they're supernatural, at which point you then can then press them for what the heck they actually mean. As a tip for those who give into the temptation of watching more videos from this emo clown, always look up his citations. That's actually a good practice in general, but it's absolutely necessary with him. Then he quotes the part of the Hangout right after the part he skipped, where we're talking about a video which Rob did a number of months ago. But yeah, I really like that one about like, okay, so there seems to be evidence for Kim Jong-il existing. Yeah, or, well, I guess there's Kim pretty Jong-il. solid evidence. If, 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 if North Koreans are not atheists because they believe Kim Jong-il is a god, then uh, uh, I think there's pretty solid evidence Kim Jong-il exists. Logic goes on to give this analysis. First, I was really unsure what point you were even trying to make, because my brain just refused to comprehend something this stupid. But after putting a little bit of thought into the garbled mess that you're spewing out and watching the original Hacking Atheism video that you guys are discussing right now, I think I figured out what you're trying to say. Atheists should not believe that North Koreans who believe Kim Jong-il is a god are theists because those atheists say there's no evidence for any god, but there is evidence for Kim Jong-il's existence, and so atheists should believe that Kim Jong-il cannot be numbered among the gods that people believe in, even if people worship him as one, because otherwise they're implicitly admitting that there is a god that there's evidence for? Ha ha ha, gotcha. Apparently. I... <sighs> I mean, that's the smartest I can make it sound. Before I get into talking about the meat of this response, I want to make it clear that his response is a useless waste of time. He's talking about whether North Korea should be considered as being on Team Atheism or Team Theism. That is how an idiot looks at the question. And I want to be clear, because this is an important point. That is how someone less worth talking to than a houseplant looks at the question. And houseplants are not worth talking to. The question that non-idiots consider is about which ideas drove which actions, because ideas have consequences. There is a world of difference between thinking that human beings are a bunch of chemicals, which only have meaning if you choose to give it to them, and thinking that human beings are fellow images of God, whom God, our mutual creator, loves. Now, I know it won't necessarily seem that big a difference to people who are as timid as rabbits and therefore wouldn't hurt a fly no matter what they believe, But if you take an hour out of your busy schedule to study history, you will discover that plenty of people are not timid, and require very good reasons indeed to not simply dispose of human beings who have become a problem to them. Somewhere around 100 million human beings were disposed of in the 20th century for being inconvenient to someone else. There are lots of people who are not timid. Though, curiously, many of the men who were ultimately responsible for the disposing actually were timid, and had to employ men who weren't timid to do the dirty work. No matter how you look at it, timidity will not take the place of believing that human beings have value, even if you can't see it. But let's set aside the fact that no matter how well argued Logic's response is, it's garbage. It's garbage anyway. Let's start with his claim to have watched Rob's original Hacking Atheism video. Here's the segment we were talking about, that Logic claimed to have watched. 
Now, atheists often bring up atrocities committed by Christians throughout history, so you can bring up atrocities committed by atheists throughout history. More importantly, atrocities committed by atheists with the objective of eliminating religious belief, and you can use the USSR and North Korea as examples. Now, the scripted atheist response is that the USSR and North Korea were never really atheists, and that in Stalinist USSR, Stalin was God, and the North Koreans have a national religion called Jush. Of course, all atheists are experts in North Korean culture, naturally. The North Koreans have a national religion called Jush, wherein Kim Il-sung is their god. So you can respond to this very simply by saying, are these the gods you claim there's no evidence for? Because there's pretty good historical evidence that Joseph Stalin and Kim Il-sung existed. Now, if the atheist says, no, of course that's not what I mean, then they implicitly recognize that there's a difference between a transcendent god and a thing in the world that may be worshipped as god, defeating their entire premise that the USSR and North Korea were never really atheists. Yes, they were atheists for every purpose relevant to modern day discussions about atheism. Rob began this segment of his video by saying that he was addressing atheists trying to dissociate atheism from the atrocities committed by atheist regimes, then concluded by saying that these regimes were atheist in every sense that matters to that discussion. And at the crux, he explained that in trying to get out of there clearly being evidence for Kim Jong-il, the atheist will implicitly admit he can tell the difference between a transcendent god who gives meaning and value to all of creation and a mere thing in the world. Rob's point isn't hard to understand. Instead, logic goes on and on about how the people of North Korea should be considered theists because they worship the Kims as gods, even if they're wrong. He avoids specifics, of course, because those would be utterly devastating to his point. Here, let me read the beginning of the Wikipedia article on Zhisha. Zhisha, usually left untranslated, or translated as self-reliance, is the official state ideology of North Korea described by the government as Kim Il-sung's original, brilliant, and revolutionary contribution to national and international thought. It says that man is the master of his destiny, that the North Korean masses are to act as the masters of the revolution in construction, and that by becoming self-reliant and strong can a nation achieve true socialism. Perhaps you might be wondering where the part about Kim Il-sung creating the world out of nothing in seven days is, or at least the part where Kim Il-sung will judge each man after his death or even just where Kim Jong-il can throw thunderbolts. In fact, if you do a text search on the Wikipedia page for Zhisha, the word God does not appear in it at all. Granted, Wikipedia isn't the best source, but this is suggestive. And in fairness, if you go over to the page on the North Korean cult of personality, you will find mention of Kim Il-sung creating the world and Kim Jong-il controlling the weather with his thoughts. But if you look up the source for that, it's a PBS obituary for Kim Jong-il, which only says... According to some reports, many North Koreans believe that Kim Il-sung created the world and that Kim Jong-il controlled the weather. The article has no citation, of course, and for all we know this means that exactly 2,290 North Koreans believe those things. That would be many North Koreans. And more to the point, this may just be an instance of people telling gullible Western journalists stupid things for fun because the same Wikipedia article states that official North Korean sources say that Kim Il-sung came from a long lineage of leaders. Are the North Koreans supposed to think that Kim Il-sung created his great-great-grandfather long before he was born? Especially in a culture which reveres their ancestors? However, if you give even a cursory glance to the readily verifiable aspects of the cult of personality surrounding the Kims, you'll see that they are supposed to be the most excellent men who ever lived. They aren't supposed to be something other than men. And you can see this in what forms the bulk of the state mythology about Kim Jong-il. The state doesn't tell stories of him throwing thunderbolts and flying around on winged horses. It tells stories of Kim Jong-il being a brilliant sportsman, a brilliant filmmaker, a brilliant manager, driving a car at three years old, and so on. The whole idea is that the people culminate in their great leader as the head of a unified body. If he were a member of some other species, even a divine species, the socialist man at the center of everything, Corps of Zhusha, would fall apart. So, once again, we come to the point where somebody throwing stupid slogans around about lacking a belief in God or gods, and that North Korea isn't atheist because it worships the Kims as gods, has to, when confronted with the contradictions in his slogans, stop sloganizing and say what he actually means. And the moment that he does that, his point about North Korea having nothing to do with how atheists behave when in power utterly falls apart. Because to claim otherwise is to claim that the repressive evil of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea 
only happened because the people of North Korea believed the state propaganda. But the state was the one committing the atrocities. So you'd have to argue that the people making the stories up did what they did because they believed the stories which they themselves invented in order to control the populace. And there's an even further point, though this goes beyond what most atheists can grasp. Most people will not create values. They will only value something which someone they look up to gives them to value. If it is not God, it will be men whom they follow. There will never be a libertarian, atheist utopia where all people live independently, everyone thinking for himself, all of them logically determining by their own research what makes them happiest, so long as it respects the rights of others, and following that. That is pure fantasy. The overwhelming majority of human beings will always worship something in exchange for some direction to their lives. If they have nothing better available, they'll worship politicians and athletes and people who are famous just for being famous. If you really think it makes all the difference if someone worships Hillary Clinton and thinks she's the most qualified person ever to run for president but never did anything supernatural versus worships Hillary Clinton and thinks she's the most qualified person ever to run for president and once brought a turtle back to life by kissing it, you're just kidding yourself. Both people would go along with every policy she had about outlawing men or whatever evil scheme you want to hypothetically posit in this example. Nearly having a cult of personality around a leader does not make a state not atheist in any sense worth talking about, even if some of the people who worship their dear leader get carried away and embellish with a few stories about how the birds sang the national anthem at their dear leader's birth. Be that as it may... The point is that the argument for dissociating the horrors of atheist regimes from their atheism is far more complex than just saying, but leader worship. If you want to dissociate these two, you have to actually explain how whatever claims of the supernatural that you can reliably source were causally related to the secular actions of that government. Hiding behind, but there was a cult of personality, is just dishonest. In other words, if you want to do this, you'll have to put down the slogans and start thinking which was Rob's whole point. If Logic wasn't lying about watching Rob's video, then he had to be lying about his pathetic, point-dodging summary being the best he could do. I don't really have anything more to say about Logic's video. If at this point you think that Logic isn't lying to you, I don't think I can help you. And if I seem angry at Logic in this video, that's why. I don't care that he insulted me. I don't care what he thinks about anything. But it bothers me to see people who can't see through charlatans like this being misled by them. He's taking advantage of people who aren't equipped to defend themselves. That bothers me. But, to end on a happy note, at least for any Christians who are watching this video, Logic ends his video with a handy list of people to pray for. Heavenly Father, please shower your blessings upon these people. And let us ask the ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, for her prayers. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.